Hey, you know, a couple weeks ago, I got the chance to hustle over here after the Kesslinger service and preach here, and Sterling was, I think, out of town at the time, but uh, I, should, I want to say publicly with him here that how much I love your campus pastor, how great, how fantastic it is that you have him, and what a great job he's doing. Not just because he has a fantastic beard, but he really loves you and does a great job, so let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you for loving us and for speaking to us. We've been singing about your truth. And hearing it read, now we ask you to speak, not just, God, that I would speak, but that you would speak through me, the words that we each need to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a quick question. Do you remember the last words you spoke today? How many of you know immediately what you, last, last thing you spoke out loud? Anybody? How many of you are like, I'm not totally sure what I said last? How many of you aren't listening? Right? <laughs> yes, that's me. I'm not listening. Do you know how many words you speak in a day, the average person? How about how many words you speak in a week or a year? Estimates tell us that the average person, the average adult, if you take all the words they speak in a lifetime of 80, if they live 80 years, the average person, they speak in 80 years of their life, just spoken words only, not written, not typed, spoken out loud, and you would just play them like a tape, one after the other, it would be one-fifth of your life. A fifth of your life is talking. In a year, you speak enough words, the average person, to fill about 100 books of 200 pages or more. I probably am more than that, because I talk for a living. Some of you are like, well, I don't talk that much. The point is, it's a lot of words. We talk a lot. We're filling our lives and the world with words. But what are all these words really saying? What difference are they making? What are they producing? What are they bringing about? Given all this talking and all this, these words, it wouldn't, shouldn't surprise us then if a fifth of your life is words that you speak out loud, it shouldn't surprise you that God's word would have something to say about your words and my words. And we're in a series called Street Level Faith on the letter of James. James writing to Christians around the Roman world, uh, speaking to them, and as you've seen, we've talked about in the weeks past, his primary concern is not really your theology. He sort of assumes you get Jesus. Maybe that's a big assumption, but James seems to assume that. His primary concern is, well, what difference does it make then in your life? What, how does that translate into how you live? His concern is with your everyday life, your faith in everyday life. What's more everyday or practical than the words you speak? So let's open, if you have your Bibles, to James chapter 3, or you can follow with me on the screen. Verses will be the first 12 verses, James 3, 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now, I told you, James, James is, he's not, he doesn't mix words. He's not trying to be, uh, like, cute or uh, vague. He's very direct, and he's very direct here. But verse 1 sounds a little bit like, a little odd, doesn't it? Like, he says, you shouldn't presume to be teachers because you'll be judged more strictly. Well, what's that have to do with it? Well, everything, really. His point is not, if you're thinking, well, I don't presume to be a teacher, so I'm off the hook. That's not so fast. He's saying, in other words, what you say matters. It matters greatly, more than you realize. And that's even, the, the more you are in a position of influence over other people, the more your words matter. So a teacher, not just in the church, Sunday school teacher, small group leader, pastor, teacher in, in a school, leading in your home, in your family, in your workplace, if you're in a position of influence over other people, 
Your words matter. So be very careful who you listen to. Be very careful what you say. God takes words seriously. Words carry immeasurable significance. As Christians, we believe that God spoke the world into existence. With a word, he made all that exists. Jesus is called the living word of God made flesh. By a word, Jesus heals people and casts out demons. We worship him by reading his word, preaching his word, singing the glories of him in his word. Words matter, especially to us. They matter greatly. And James is really continuing something he's already been talking about. In chapter 2, he says, So speak and so act like those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Meaning, talk like somebody who gets grace. Talk like somebody who understands Jesus. It ought to be evident in the way you talk that you know him. And then in chapter 1, verse 19, James says something that is so simple but so profound. He says, My brothers and sisters, let everyone be slow to speak and quick to listen. You've heard that before. Maybe your mom used to say that. My mom used to say, one of these and two of these for a reason. <laughs> I don't think it's more symmetry, mom, but anyway. What does he mean? Slow to speak, quick to listen. Aren't we living in a culture that's exactly the opposite? Isn't it exactly the opposite today? We are so quick to speak, so quick to give our opinion, so quick to criticize, so quick to demonize people we disagree with. So quick to presume that we know enough to speak with authority on any subject. And we're so slow to listen. Now, a word of confession. The, sometimes I get nervous about preaching a sermon because I don't understand the text well enough yet. But that actually is kind of fun for me. It's a challenge. I enjoy studying. I enjoy researching. I feel like I can do that. Other times I get nervous to preach because I feel like I don't really live up to this one. This is one of those. This is an area where God's still working. Well, there are lots of areas where God's still working on me. This is one of them. It's the top of the list. My words are not as honoring to God or as honoring to other people as I want them to be and as he wants them to be. I was convicted even preparing this. I had to even confess a couple things to my family members. But it also was good news for me because it was like God was saying, I'm not done with you yet. We still got, maybe that will be true for you as well. I hope it will be. Okay, first, the power of the tongue. First kind of point James makes here, the power of the tongue. We've been talking about its power, tremendous power in words. Wars are started over words. In fact, I found this little interesting anecdote. I love history and strange little bits of history. Um, if any of you listen to Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, The Re Revisionist History, it's very interesting. He takes things that are misunderstood, perhaps, in, in history. And, and Anyway, I came across this little interesting tidbit about World War II. Uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and we were engaged with the war in both Europe and in the Pacific, uh, we issued, as we were advancing in, in, uh, in the Pacific, we had issued an ultimatum to the Empire of Japan, uh, telling them to back off, give up the territories they'd conquered, and surrender, or there would be immediate and total devastation in our, in our response. Prime Minister Kentaro Suzuki replied with a single word in Japanese, the word mokusatsu. And he meant that word as no comment. The word in Japanese literally has come from two words, silence and kills. The, he meant it as no comment, so he said. It was taken by the American and British media as kill them with silence. Say nothing. Not worthy of a response, in other words. Ten days later, we dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. I'm not saying the word caused it, but words are powerful. Even words that are misunderstood. I'll give you an example of my own life. Years ago, many years ago, over, over a decade ago, almost probably 15 years ago, we had a, a group come in to speak to students, and I was the youth pastor, um, and they were talking about sexual purity and waiting till marriage, and, and the woman was the keynote speaker. After she'd come and given the talk, uh, it came out in the, in the news that she had been through a divorce where her husband had left her, and, it got, and she got sort of excoriated in the, like for, for hiding this, and some people in our church were nervous about this, and so I wrote her a note, wanting her to know, because uh, I knew some of the details in, about it, that, and, I, and, I, and I wrote, what I typed in my letter was, I am not condemning you, but I left out one word. The word not. I typed and sent with a mail, a stamp, I am condemning you. Won't she be encouraged in the Lord <laughs> when she receives this letter? You know? <laughs> Power of a word, right? Even a missing word. Now, it took a lot of tears and apology for her to believe me when I said, I, I, I left out a word. Because spell check doesn't, doesn't find the words you don't type. 
I wish it did. Power of a word. Let me read verses 3 through 5 again. James says in verse 3, We put bits in the mouths of horses so they obey us. We guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. He uses these examples of bit and rudder uh, for the horse and the, and the ship. And his point is this. His point is that little things make a big difference. And he's talking about direction. The bit enables you to direct the horse. Is the Miller family here? I know they have horses. They're in the equine, the equine life. It's such a thing. But I've seen 12-year-old girls ride horses. And on a 900 to 1,000-pound quarter horse, make that horse go right where they want. Why? Because a small thing like the bit. The ship directs the rudder. James is saying, your tongue, your words, cause a direction in your life and in the life of others. There's a directional impact they're having. Whoever said the, the phrase to kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, was probably deaf. <laughs> That's so not true. You know that as an adult. How many of you can remember right now words that wounded you? Show of hands. Every one of us. My dad's in his 70s. He still tells the story when he was fifth grade. He was carving his initials on the underside of the desk, on the old desk that would lift up. He was carving his initials in there, and his teacher came by and stood behind him. He didn't see her, and she leaned over, and she said, Joseph Frazier, you are dead weight to the world. <laughs> Sixty years ago, he still tells that story. He kind of laughs about it, but he still tells it. He remembers it. Words wound. Those wounds go deep, and they take a long time to heal. They stay with us, don't they? Some of you know that. All of you do. How many of you can recall, on the other side, words that have blessed you? Words that gave life to you? Sometimes those are harder to remember, especially if you've been wounded. I will never forget the precious words my wife's grandfather spoke to me. He was a, a Baptist pastor for over 50 years. He's the patriarch of the family, six foot six. He pitched for the Cardinals organization. I mean, I can forgive him for that, but he pitched for the Cardinals. He pitched with Dizzy Dean. And he was a rookie pitcher with the Cardinals. He was in a hotel lobby because uh, he couldn't go to church because they were on, on, on the road. And he was reading his Bible on a Sunday morning. And Dizzy Dean comes in with his entourage of women after being out drinking all night. And he sees him sitting there in the lobby. And he, my wife's maiden name is Johnson. And Dizzy Dean says to, to Douglas Johnson, Johnson, what are you doing? What are you reading? He said, I'm reading the Bible. He says, you don't believe that blankety blank, do you? He says, I sure do. Why? And he starts to share the gospel with Dizzy Dean and all of his entourage. And he goes, ah, time out. You've got to buy us all around if you want us to listen to you. So he bought them all drinks and told them about Jesus. <laughs> and he says, that was the moment he knew I'm, 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 I'm to be a preacher, a pastor, not a baseball player, not a pitcher. And he gave it up. Anyway, he came to hear me preach the first, the second time I ever preached. Youth pastor at a different church many, many years ago, over, over 20, I don't know, 23, 4, 5 years ago. And, and I have the tape of this. It was terrible. I mean, it was terrible. I, I know it was terrible. I've listened to it. It's embarrassing. I should burn the tape. We went out to lunch afterwards. And he could have told me a thousand things I could have done better. And he'd been right. And I would have listened to him. But he didn't. He's in his 80s. I'm preaching my second sermon. And he says words of life to me. He affirmed me. He blessed me. He told me what a good job I did and how much people need to hear me preach the word of God. And he affirmed my calling. And I've not been the same since. I remember it like it was yesterday sitting there across the table from him, this patriarch of my wife's family who I respected so much. I see that as one of the spiritual markers in my life, words of life. Proverbs 18, verse 21 tells us, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. Your words are speaking in one direction or the other. Let me just ask you, are the words you're speaking leading you and others toward life or death? Maybe it sounds extreme to you. I don't think so. I'm reading uh, Pastor Brady Boyd. He's a pastor of New Life Church in Colorado. He wrote a book called Speak Life. It's really challenging me and encouraging me. As I said, God's still working on me. You know, one of the ways I've noticed this in myself and perhaps in some of you as well is that in my family, sarcasm is almost an art form. My wife and I, like to, we like to joke around. We like to poke fun. We're sarcastic. It's like a love language. Not really, but we say it is. And we just like to rip on each other. And, and the kids get involved in it too. And it's sort of fun. But people come over, they don't know us. They're like, oh, this is family dysfunctional. Right? <laughs> But we, we, and, and sometimes I'll say things that are a little over the top. 
a little too far. And you know what I'll do at the end of them? I'll say, just kidding. Just joking. Can't you take a joke? Come on. Don't worry about that hurtful thing I said. I was just joking. Let me read to you. It won't be on the screen what the words of Proverbs say in Proverbs 26. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the one who deceives his neighbor and says, I am only joking. What? <laughs> Told you this was a convicting one. Words of life, the words of death. That's so we see that words are incredibly powerful for blessing and cursing for life and death. And James says there's a problem, the problem of the tongue. He's not saying, get a hold of your tongue or it's going to cause trouble. What he's saying actually is you can't. You can't tame it. You can't actually ultimately control it. Let's look at verses 6 through 10 again from chapter 3. I keep saying I need reading glasses. My wife says, well, stop saying it and wear them. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father. With it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. Verse 7, he says, we can tame almost any wild creature. Now, maybe you're like me, you're going, I don't, wait a second. I mean, I know they put orcas on this, uh, in the show, but they haven't tamed the blue whale. I was thinking about That's where my head goes. <laughs> maybe it's a rhetorical flourish, right? They tame lions. Well, kind of. Remember Siegfried and Roy? One of them got his face bit off by a lion, so they didn't really tame them. But that's not, you get James's point. His point is, like, we have incredible power and ingenuity uh, in our own effort to do remarkable things, to bring, harness the forces of creation and of, of the animal kingdom, but we can't even control the two-ounce tongue. G.K. Chesterton called it the, the untamable two-ounce beast. How many of you ever had this experience? You say something, and almost before the words are out, but certainly as soon as they are out, you think, why did I say that? Anybody? Liars, so you didn't put your hand up, right? <laughs> why, I, why, why would I say that? I know what that's going to cause. James says the tongue is full of deadly poison. It does damage. It sets a fire. In Ephesians 4, 15, the Apostle Paul says that we are to speak uh, the truth in love to one another. I like that phrase, truth in love. You need both. I would put it this way. Words are damaging, poisonous, and hurtful when they are either untruthful and or unloving. You must have both. The Bible itself is truth and love, isn't it? It's not all sunshine and rainbows. It's not written to make you feel good about yourself. There's a hard edge. You're a sinner. You're far from God. Your life is broken. You are an object of God's wrath until you repent and receive the grace and love he wants to give you. But there's words of life in here as well, Tr and truth and love. So think about your own words for a minute. So some of you are the truth kind of person. Particularly in the church I see this. We think, well I spoke the truth, it's not my problem how they respond. Like the person who says the, the, the truth, but at the wrong time and in the wrong way. And then you think, well I did my job. No you didn't. No you didn't. Your job's not to bash people over the head with truth. It's to love them with truth. And if you're so harsh and uncaring and unthoughtful in the way you speak it, that they can't receive it, that's not truth because they're not getting it. On the other hand, some of you are more like this. You're like, well, I, I know it's true, and I know she needs to hear it, but I know what's going to happen. She's going to hate me, she's going to get mad, she's going to feel bad, or it's going to be awful. I'm not, it's not worth it. That's not loving. Truth without love is not truth. Love without truth is not loving. Speak the truth in love. It's a pretty good filter for us, actually, to think, are the words I'm about to speak, are they truthful? Are the words I'm about to speak, are they loving? And Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 36, that uh, I'll tell you on Judgment Day, every person will give an account for every careless word they speak. That ought to make you tremble a little bit. It does me. I've got a lot of accounting to do. There have been more than a few careless words. Our words matter. And there's a problem because we can't tame them. We can't ultimately rein them in. I mean, you could for a time stop saying certain things, I suppose. But ultimately speaking, 
you can't fix it. This is the problem. So what do we do? What's the solution? Words are powerful and dangerous, but they're also, and we can't tame our tongue. Well, Jesus in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if your right eye caused you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. If your right hand caused you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. So maybe we should apply that to our tongue. <laughs> Years ago, this is somewhat related, I, was, uh, I had finished playing football in college and played a little bit in the Arena Football League. I know you probably don't believe that by looking at me, but I'll show you pictures later. Um, anyway, it was a failed attempt, a very briefly, very brief career, and I was, uh, still had this sort of competitive thing going, and I tried to learn to play rugby. A couple of buddies recruited me to play on their semi-pro rugby team called the Chicago Shamrocks, and I didn't know what I was doing, but I went and played rugby. And in the second rugby game I ever played in, and we're in this field, and I'm going to tackle this guy, and his knee comes up, and I wasn't wearing a mouthpiece, hits me right out of the chin, bang! And I bit almost all the way through my tongue. I mean, it was hanging by about a quarter of an inch, like this. And they don't really care in rugby. They're like, mm, yeah, okay, sucks to be you, we're gonna keep playing. I just kept, I'm seriously, I was sitting there like, <laughs> and blood is pouring out of my mouth. I drove myself to the emergency room. I had to spit blood out the window at every corner. I got to the desk and the lady's looking at me like, sir, what is your problem? And I got a mouthful of blood. I grabbed her coffee cup and went, <laughs> she goes, ah! and she like let me in. And they stitched my tongue up, 12 stitches to put my tongue back together. And then I was supposed to speak at like a youth retreat a week later. I'm like, <laughs> I seriously was like, <laughs> anyway. That's not what Jesus is saying. Don't bite your tongue off or cut your tongue off. This brings us to the transformation of the tongue. What's the remedy then to our problem? Well, back in verse 2, James says that we all stumble in many ways. That's good news to me. And then he says, if anyone doesn't stumble with their words, they're like a perfect person. He's being facetious. And then in verse 11 and 12, at the end of the portion we read, he gives us a hint of how this really, what really is the remedy to this issue. Let me read it for you. Does a spring pour forth this from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. What's he saying there? He's saying the words that come out of your mouth and off of your tongue are, are, are revealing something deeper. They're revealing a truth about what's going on in your heart. There's a source. It's not just the words. So it's not just a matter of so, stop saying stupid things. There's something deeper going on. And James is really echoing the words of his older brother, half-brother Jesus. For Jesus in Luke chapter 6 says this in verses 43 to 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Think about that. What's coming out of your mouth is revealing about what's in here. This is, I, I remember years ago, a guy came to see me, and he, was, uh, he wanted to talk, like pastoral counseling, because he kept kind of freaking out at his kid, his youngest son. He had two, a daughter and a son, his son was the youngest. And he would just say things that were, he would lose his, he would get over the top, and, and it was, there was a, his wife was upset with him, and he, he realized, I'm not, I'm not doing this well, I'm a bad father, but I don't know why I keep doing this. And we talked for a while, and I said, well, what, what kind of things? He said, well, my son's kind of hyper, and he gets all excited, and he, and he gets real energetic, and I find myself getting annoyed so easily and tell him to calm down, and it's like I'm crushing his spirit. I don't know why I do that. And as we talked, and I got to know him, he told me a story about how when he was a little boy, they moved around a ton when he was a kid, and he was always trying to make friends, and one particular friend group he thought he was trying to make friends with in a new town, the kid said, so-and-so, you're such a spaz to him. He said that word, like, stung him and, and like, went down deep. You're such a spaz. And he says, what, basically what ended up happening was, every time he saw in his son behavior that reminded him how he used to act, he'd freak out. And he'd say stuff that would hurt him. Power of a word, right? In his heart, this is a wounded guy carrying around that. And it's leaking out onto his kid. So what do we do? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, taming the tongue is about healing the heart. That's why you can't tame the tongue, because it's just revealing what's already in here. Only God heals the heart. Only Christ does that. 
I remember reading through the World Harvest Mission Discipleship Manual years ago. We were putting together a discipleship group class, and I was reading some of the things they did. They had every week was framed out in a, new, a different exercise in growing in your faith. And one of them was on your words. And they literally had this challenge for a whole week, if you're part of this World Discipleship Mission dis- program, for one whole week, say nothing to boast about yourself, say nothing to elicit a compliment from someone else, say nothing that draws attention to yourself, say nothing to gossip about somebody else, and say nothing that would uh, to hurt or disparage another person, whether they're with you or not. For a week. I think that's crazy. I can't go a day. Can you go a day and say nothing to draw attention to yourself, boast about yourself, defend yourself, and say nothing at all, even slightly, even off color or being funny, to hurt or disparage or criticize somebody else? In fact, I'll give you this challenge. I'm going to do it. You do it with me. Tomorrow, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., try it for half a day. Try from 8 to 2 to say nothing to promote yourself or hurt somebody else. And just take, just take mental note of all the impulses you have to speak that come from fear or anxiety or insecurity or pride. And again, I, not to make you feel terrible about yourself, but to encourage you, God's not done. He wants better. It's actually good news. Because here's the thing, until... until People call blind, blind spots are called blind spots for a reason. Do you know what the reason is? You don't see them, right? They're, you're blind to them. So until, like this little experiment, the point of it would be like to, be, to become aware of stuff in my heart so that I could confess it and so Jesus can work on it. Because if I don't see it, I don't confess it. If I don't confess it, he's not dealing with it. And all that happens is it's just producing more words that hurt myself and others. Let me ask this question. What do your words reveal about your heart? I asked you a moment ago, what's the last word you spoke before you walked in here? The fifth of your life is words. What do your words reveal about your heart? Back in verse 6, James uses the image of a fire. He says, the tongue is a fire. Is he just being rhetorical? Is it just like a little pastoral flourish there? I don't think so. Because in the Bible, there's two kinds of fire. There's the kind of fire that destroys, and there's the kind of fire that refines and purifies. And in, in Acts chapter 2, when the first Christians are together, and it's called Pentecost, and the Spirit of God comes on them in power, and they speak words of life, words of hope and grace of the gospel. And the Bible tells us that appearing above their head were tongues of fire. I don't think that's an accident. I think what James is saying to us, the reason you can't tame your tongue and you can't stop saying stupid things and hurtful things is because it's a matter of the heart. And even if you could stop saying things for a while, you haven't healed your heart. Only Jesus does that. Will you let him do that? Let him do that. What if if we, South Street, Mill Creek, Kesslinger, what if we became a community known by our words, words of life, I want that, and I'm not there. What if we were just stood out? You know, years ago, I was a volunteer football coach at Batavia High School, and I would go in the locker room after practices and after games and hang with the coaches and talk, and one of the things I noticed about coaches is they don't always talk that nice in the locker room after games or practices. And one of the things that bothered me is some, some of the guys would make off-color jokes about their wives. And I wouldn't do that. But it, was, but it reminded, I felt convicted that it's not just not saying bad stuff. So I thought, I'm going to try to go the other way here. I'm going to try to find ways to talk about how awesome my wife is. That was weird, let me tell you. <laughs> They're like saying something funny, and I'm like, oh, my wife is great. And they're like, mm-hmm. My point is this. It stood out. It was so different. What if we were just different? Because we had been so full of the grace of Jesus in my heart that I cannot, I, it just bubbles out of my mouth. I talk about it. I'm not interested in getting... Uh, you to praise me or defending myself or spinning things so I look better. I mean, I am, but I don't want to be. What if I wasn't? What if you weren't? Worried about your reputation and using your words to promote yourself. What if you weren't worried about, you don't have to bring anyone down and make yourself feel better because you know you're loved perfectly by Jesus. You ever find yourself always giving your resume to somebody, spiritually or otherwise? What is that about? I do that. It's in the heart. What if we're so full of the grace of Jesus in our heart that we just speak words of life to each other? And people see it, and they hear it, and they think, 
I want to be around that person because I'm safe with them. Because they're not trying to get something from me because they're blessing me. Our words reveal the one that we claim rules our hearts. Let it be Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this ancient letter, which is really profoundly relevant for our lives. And we confess to you that we fall far short. We, we don't speak words of life. We don't control our tongue. And we're asking you, Lord Jesus, to do the work you want to do, which is to heal our hearts. And that would translate into the words we speak, what comes out of our mouths. So fill us up, Lord, with your grace and your love and your mercy that we might speak words of life. We pray this in Jesus' name.